we, we stopped at the break. We are reading about the yoga realizations of King Asvapati, who will become the human father of Savitri. And particularly in this canto, we are reading about how as the result of the secret knowledge which he gained in the previous canto, he has envisaged the possibility, a distant possibility, a hope immense, that it might be possible to establish on earth a diviner life than the one we experience now. And he commits his whole being totally to that aspiration. And as a result, um, it's uh, the, the image that Sri Aurobindo gives is of him taking off like a rocket. You know? And in response to that intense upward aspiration, there comes a very powerful descent which seizes Asvapati, his whole nature, and transforms it. So as a result of that, um, on page 83, the last sentence before the break, it says, the soul and cosmos faced as equal powers. This is something extraordinary that Sri Aurobindo tells us. We think of ourselves as such tiny little beings compared to the vastness of the universe. But he says, when we get the full self-realization, then the soul, the individual soul, and the universe can look at each other as equal powers. It's not that uh, the universe is bigger and the soul is tiny. It's not like that. The divine expresses himself equally as the individual, as the universal, and as the transcendent. Here he just su suggests it in this single line. The soul and cosmos faced as equal powers. A boundless being in a measureless time invaded nature with the infinite. He saw unpathed, unwalled his titan scope. He sees all infinite possibility opening up in front of him. No more walls, no more paths. No. And the word titan suggests a su superhuman scale. So I'm going to read on from there for about a page, and then we'll go back and look at um, each sentence in detail. All was uncovered to his sealless eye. This is King Asvapati. A secret nature stripped of her defense, once in a dreaded half light, formidable, overtaken in her mighty privacy lay bare to the burning splendor of his will. In shadowy chambers lit by a strange sun and opening hardly to hid mystic keys, her perilous arcanes and hooded powers confessed the advent of a mastering mind and bore the compulsion of a time-born gaze. 
incalculable in their wizard molds, immediate and invincible in the act. Her secret strengths, native to greater worlds, lifted above our needy, limited scope, the occult privilege of demigods, and the sure power pattern of her cryptic signs, her diagrams of geometric force, her potencies of marvel fraught design, courted employment by an earth-nursed might. A conscious nature's quick machinery, armed with a latent splendor of miracle, the prophet passion of a seeing mind, and the lightning bareness of a free soul force. All once impossible deemed could now become a natural limb of possibility, a new domain of normalcy supreme. An almighty occultist erects in space this seeming outward world which tricks the sense. He weaves his hidden threads of consciousness. He builds bodies for his shapeless energy. Out of the unformed and vacant vast, he has made his sorcery of solid images, his magic of formative number and design. The fixed irrational links none can annul. This crisscross tangle of invisible laws, his infallible rules, his covered processes, achieve unerringly an inexplicable creation where our error carves dead frames of knowledge for a living ignorance. In her mysteries moods, Divorced from the Maker's laws, she too, as sovereignly, creates her field. Her will, shaping the undetermined vasts, making a finite of infinity, she too can make an order of her caprice, as if her rash superb wagered to outvie the veiled creator's cosmic secrecies. The rapid footsteps of her fantasy, amid whose falls wonders like flowers rise, are surer than reason defter than device, and swifter than imagination's wings. All she knew fashions by the thought and word, compels all substance by her wand of mind. So it is always difficult when we are reading a passage for the first time to work out who is he and who is she. And here it's specially confusing. So it starts, the passage starts, all was uncovered to his sealless eye. This is King Aswapati. 
as the result of that transformation that he's undergone. He can see things. He can see the laws governing the whole universe. And one of the things he sees is a secret nature. We always have this uh, uh, contrast between the Lord and his conscious force who acts in the world as nature, as Shakti, as Prakriti. But now uh, we are not hearing about the ordinary earth nature that we are familiar with. This is a secret, occult nature. She's been hidden. But now, because he can see everything, it's as if her defense, her veils, her protections are stripped away. And he can see the way that she works. And Shobindo gives us a brief description of her workings and how Aswapati sees them. And then he contrasts the, na- the workings of this secret nature with um, the workings of the creator of the universe. So that becomes the he at the end of the paragraph that I read. So let's have a look sentence by sentence. Martin, would you begin, please? Lord was uncovered to see us eyes. A secret nature stripped of her defense, once in a dreadful half life formidable, overtaking in her mighty privacy the reveal to the burning splendor of this will. So this all is uncovered to his sealless eye. There's no more seal blinding his eyes. He has a universal vision. And one of the things he sees is this secret nature. She's been stripped of her defense. Her workings are revealed to him. This secret nature is something that the spiritual seeker has to be careful about. She can be dangerous. So that's why Sri Aurobindo says that once she was a a formidable force in a dreaded half-light, something to be careful about. Mother, for example, all the books about occultism in the ashram library, she had them locked up in a special cupboard and uh, they were only to be given to somebody if she gave specific permission and her own guidance. Occultism is a very great power, but it can be dangerous, especially to impure human beings. So once that uh, power of hers was something formidable, dreaded, but now she is overtaken in her mighty privacy, in her secret places. He is able to penetrate there and see her. And she's laid bare, stripped of all her defenses. She will have to obey the burning splendor of his will. So Mother and Sri Aurobindo uh, advised all of us to be very careful against seeking occult powers. But if they come to a spiritualized, spiritually realized soul, as King Asvapati has become, he's undergone this divine transformation because of the purity of his aspiration and his being, um, he can master this secret power. So there she lies bare to the burning splendor of his will. She will have to do what he commands her. Bhuvana. Mm. It's very interesting. One uh, old Rovillian coming in 1968, and he tells to Mother, I want to read occultism book. Mother tell no, not for you, read Savitri. Mm. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. So I think she said that to many people, <laughs> only to a very few people. She shared some of the secrets of occultism in her own way. Um, Bhuvana. In shadowy chambers lit with strange sun, an opening hobby to hit mystic keys, her perilous appearance and hooded powers confess the advent of a mastering mind and both the compulsion of a time worn gaze. Yes. So <coughs> he finds her in these shadowy secret chambers. They are lit by a strange sun, not our sun, not a sun of the material universe, a different kind of light. And those shadowy chambers, it's difficult to open them. You need special keys, and those keys are hidden. Okay, those uh, doors open hardly to hid mystic keys. But in those shadowy chambers, he finds her perilous arcanes. Perilous means very dangerous. Perilous. Arcanes, we usually uh, know it in the form arcana, in occultism. This means secret, secret knowledge. So her dangerous secret knowledge and her hooded powers, her occult powers which are disguised and hidden. Now, when Aswapati comes and sees them, they have to confess the advent of a mastering mind. The advent means the arrival, the coming. So they have to recognize but here is a greater power, a mind which is strong enough to master and control them, these dangerous secrets and these hidden, disguised powers. They have to bear the compulsion of a time-born gaze. When Aswapati looks at them, <laughs> they are not used to being seen and looked at by uh, human beings born in time. But they have to recognize that this one is special and has the power to see them and control them. The compulsion of this case means he, he can look at them and with the power of his his gaze, the force of his will and his intention, they have to do what he says. <laughs> um, Corinne. Mm -hmm. He touched the ball in the wizard mode, immediately visible in the act. Her secret strength native to greater worlds lifted above our newly limited scope. The upper privilege of the gods and the sure power pattern of her cryptic signs, her diagrams of geometric force, her potencies of marble front design, courted employment by a first nurse mind. Oh, thank you. So her secret strengths, those hooded powers, no? They are native to greater worlds than ours. They, they come from, their home is in greater worlds than our material world. And um, they are incalculable in their wizard modes. Their action seems to be magical and unpredictable. We can't calculate what they will do and they are immediate and invincible in the act. When they act, they act immediately. There's no delay, 
and they can't be prevented from acting. They're invincible, they can't be conquered. These secret strengths which are native to greater worlds, greater worlds that are lifted above our world, our needy, limited scope. The scope of our power and our knowledge is limited and we always feel that we need more. These powers, these secret strengths, are the occult privilege of demigods, of half-divine beings. And the sure power patterns of her cryptic signs, one of the ways in which these hooded powers work it is through diagrams and signs hmm, which have to be learned how, how they can be controlled and used properly. Hmm. Her diagrams of geometric force, if things are just placed in the right relationship, that has a special effect. Her potencies, her great powers of marvel thought design, certain arrangements, certain designs work like magic, marvel thought, it means loaded with wonder, with marvel, with marvelousness. All these powers of hers, now they are asking to be used by King Aswapati. They courted employment by an earth-nursed mind. King Aswapati is a human being. He's been nursed by earth. But now through this great spiritual realization, he's become able to make use of all these secret powers. And they crowd around asking to be used. They want to be used. Yes, some of them. F-R-A-U-G-T. Something that's fraught it means it's heavily loaded. So these powers are, these, uh, these designs are loaded with marvelous power, unpredictable and invincible power. Arima, with three lines from the bottom. Ecclesiastes nature's quick machinery armed with the religion splendor of miracles, the chronic passion of the seeing mind, and the lightning fairness of the three soul force. All the ones impossible being will now become the natural name of the city, and we do the name of normal city. Yeah. So what is the secret nature now stripped of her defense, revealed to King Aswapati? It is a conscious nature. We think of our earth nature as being unconscious. It isn't really, but its consciousness is hidden and disguised. But this is a conscious nature, and its machinery is full of life, works quickly, with uh, not only speed, but um, with a life liveliness. And what it does is that it gives to King Aswapati like a weapon. It gives him the prophet passion of a seeing mind and the lightning bareness of a free soul force. You arm somebody, you give them a weapon. So these powers arm King Aspapati with latent splendor, the possibility of wonderful, splendid, miraculous workings. No? And they give that to his mind, his mind which is now capable of seeing so much and his mind is activated by this
prophet passion, this great possibility which he has seen for the future of the earth, that it could become a divine life in the material world. That's the prophet passion that is activating him. So he's given these weapons, these possibilities to help him realize. And he's given, or he achieves, this lightning bareness, this great flashing light uncovered by any dimness, the light of a free soul force. This canto is about the spirit's freedom and greatness. Imminent. Imminent means dwelling within, yes. And latent is something similar. It's some, uh, some possibility that is there, which can be used, which can be revealed. Okay. I'm wondering, in, in reference to being conscious, does that mean because it's perce perceived by an individual, or does it talk about nature itself? It's this particular nature, is this secret nature is much more conscious than our human nature. I think that's what it means. So this um, all that once seemed impossible, the transformation of earth nature into a divine nature, it seems impossible. When we hear about it, we have great difficulty in believing that it can ever happen. But to him, the way he's seeing things now, everything that once seemed impossible could now become a natural limb of possibility. It's just natural that this is one possibility which can be drawn on in the future. This becomes a new domain of normalcy. Yeah? We have our domains of normalcy, things that we can do or that happen, and uh, it just seems normal to us. There's nothing surprising. So these things that seem to us are impossible to him, now they seem to belong to a new realm of normality, a supreme realm. And now he's going to tell us about the almighty occultist. Would you read, Joel? An almighty occultist erects in space the seeming outward world which tricks the sense. He weaves his hidden threads of consciousness. He builds bodies for his shapeless energy. Out of the unformed and vacant vast, he has made his sorcery of solid images. His magic of formative number and design, the fixed irrational links none can annul, this criss-cross tangle of invisible law, his infallible rules, his covered processes achieve unerringly an inexplicable, inexplicable creation where our error cards dead frames of knowledge for living ignorance. Mm. So this is a lovely description by Shel Bendo about our world. He says our world has been made by an almighty occultist, somebody who has a secret knowledge, an all-powerful occultist who has erect or is erecting in space this seeming outward world, which seems so real to us, which we believe in. Yeah? But it's only a seeming world, and it's only an outward world that deals 
with um, things outside us, surfaces, and these appearances of this seeming outward world, they trick our senses, they deceive and mislead our senses. How do we know about this world around us? We can only know uh, about the world outside our own bags of skin through the senses, the senses of sight and hearing and touch and taste and smell. And all the, when we are gathering all this data and we find it very convincing and it works for us, it's all normal, a kind of normalcy. But it's misleading us, really. We don't see how things really are. Hmm? This is just a seeming outward world. And it's been woven by this almighty occultist. He weaves his hidden threads of consciousness. We're connected to each other and to the world by threads of consciousness. There's that image of the spider no? uh, weaving its nest, um, that, uh, uh, its web. So that web is an image, actually, for the action of our senses. And I think uh, if any insect runs into the spider's web, it quivers and the spider immediately rushes to where it can uh, catch something. So similarly, our senses act like that. Something catches our attention. Uh, we get some stimulus to our hidden threads of consciousness. And he builds bodies, apparently solid bodies, forms, for his shapeless energy. Energy is not... Uh, uh, doesn't have forms, no? It's just shapeless and, and undetermined. But this almighty occultist gives shapes to these energies. He has made this sorcery, this enchantment, this magic of solid images out of this unformed and vacant, empty vastness of the universe. He's made all this. His sorcery of solid images. His magic of formative number and design. I think our physicists, more and more, they see their picture of the universe, and they see it in terms of number and design, of proportions and uh, relation, mathematical relationships that seems to give rise to all these forms and forces which are active in the universe. But still, they notice that there are some fixed links which don't seem to have any rational explanation. Why is it like that? irrational things but we are not able to change those things they, are, they really seem to be fixed the laws of physics no? this crisscross tangle of invisible laws they are running this way and that way and we can't see them but we bang up against them time and time again find ourselves facing all kinds of impossibilities and frustrations. These are due to his infallible rules and his covered processes, his secret ways of doing things. All these things together are achieving unerringly, without any kind of mistake, not the tiniest little slip, they achieve this inexplicable creation. We can't explain how it comes to exist and why it works the way it does. But we are forced somehow, our consciousness 
forces us to try to understand it. So what we do out of whatever little bit of knowledge we can grasp, he says, we create dead frames <coughs> of knowledge for a living ignorance. Here we are, we half know things, our living ignorance, and we try to organize that into nice tidy little frames that we can put them next to each other and it makes sense to us, temporarily at least. You're looking very powerful. Mm -hmm. You want to ask anything? Uh, it, it's somehow through that knowledge we make planes fly. And yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. We do. But we may, we can do all these marvels, but we have no reason, no idea why we are here, who we are and why we do this inexplicable creation. How come? How come we are here? What are we doing here? What are we meant to do? Isn't this the definition of faith? Isn't this the, the, be, the belief and the, the humility in front of all those golden threads? Because mm. there's golden threads. And faith is just, just to begin with, it's all God's Yes. Uh, Shobindo says the fact that we can have that kind of faith, which actually enables us to live from minute to minute, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to, it's actually a reflection of the soul's knowledge. But in us it's not knowledge, because we can't explain, but we have some kind of faith some kind of trust. Yeah. So that's what the Creator does. It's just one long sentence, but it's a very nice evocation of uh, what the Lord does. And now he's going to relate that to what that secret nature does. She does something similar. Would you like to read? <coughs> In her yeah, mysteries move. In her mysteries move, divorced from the maker's rose, she too has sovereignly creates her field. Her will shipping the undetermined costs, making the finite of infinity. She too can make an order of her caprice, as if her rush, rush super richer. Veiled creators, cosmic secrecies. Yes, let's pause there. There's a full stop. Huh? There's a full stop. We'll okay. pause there. Yes. So, in her mysteries, moves, this is back to that secret nature. Hmm? They are divorced from the Maker's laws. They are not the same as the laws which govern the material world. But she's just as good at it as he is. She too, as sovereignly, creates her field. She makes her subtle, mysterious world, her will, or is also able to shape these undetermined vastnesses, these empty spaces. She makes a finite of infinity. She takes hold of all Find infinite possibility and creates uh, something finite, graspable. She too can make an order of her caprice. Caprice is when you do something just for no reason at all, just like that because you feel like it. So that might be very wayward and uh, undisorderly, but she can put all her caprices somehow into a meaningful order. And it's as if she is uh, wagering, making a bet, gambling, challenging the Creator that she can do better than he can. As if her rash, superb, 
Superb is um, not usually used as a noun, but here we can say it means pride. As if, and rash means uh, uh, reckless, without uh, uh, conscious or without careful consideration. And to wager means to make a bet. She wagers that she will outvie, she will uh, compete with the Creator and do better than he can. To vie with somebody means to compete with them, rivals, and to outvie somebody means in the competition you're determined to win, you're going to do better. Yes. So it's as if she thinks in her pride that she can do better than the Creator. His the veiled Creator's cosmic secrecies, all the secrets of his universal rule. He has all his secrets. He says, I can do better. Um, Sorry? Why are all these things explained? Why are all these things explained? This is somehow leading up to King Asvapati becoming the traveler of the worlds. And in order to become the traveler of the worlds, um, he needs the help of these occult powers. And she's one of the the rulers of these occult powers. And I think it happens when we are on the, on the spiritual path, we may come into contact with them. We may notice how dangerous they are, but um, it's also true that if a spiritual seeker is pure in his intent, then they may help him. In this context, I often think about the Russian fairy tales, Rima. Um, in the Russian fairy tales, the prince, of course, is, the, is always the, the seeker. He's the one who's on the quest and he has a mission. And he has to show his mastery over these powers. When he comes to Baba Yaga's hut in the forest, it's turning round and round and round. And he says, little hut, little hut, turn your back to the forest and your face to me. No? And then ba Baba Yaga, the witch, the occult power, this power, and she notices that, oh, he is a prince. No? And she tries to entice him. She says, come in, uh, let me look after you, and all the rest of it. And he says, give me a hot bath and a good meal, and then we will discuss. <laughs> so like that, he has to show his power. And then she has to serve him. And she can tell him the way he must go on his journey. So it's interesting that in the fairy tales of many different traditions, <coughs> uh, there's uh, some imagery of these, uh, these, this occult knowledge preserved like that in stories about magic and... Uh, yeah. The Indian stories are also like this. Hmm? So many Indian stories are also like this. The other day I was thinking, I think in our schools we don't tell the Ramayana and the Mahabharata enough. No? There are so many amazing, wonderful stories full so of it's knowledge. The same story yes, same story. yes. and if in former generations, the children used to absorb all of this wonderful spiritual knowledge from their grandmothers, like that, in the form of these stories. And now I don't think it happens in the same way. I think it's a serious loss to humanity. The, the, the stories are so vulgarized, you know, we get these uh, you know, Kalakata comic books and so on. They just get vulgarized and all the subtle truth is, is uh, missed. Yes. But they're taking different forms. The same story is being told with modern things with the, this form, that form. Mm. Yes. Some stories... I, I thought here 
here in Oroville it would be something if the grandmothers would tell the old traditional stories in the old way we would all benefit not just the kids, all of us anyway, shall we go just a little further? yes, just the next uh, sentence please, come up An enchantress or an enchanter always has a wand, a magic wand, a stick, which they can use to control uh, their powers. Mm. So her wand is the wand of mind, and that's what he's going to tell us about next. That's what we'll read about next week. But here it says that uh, she, her fantasy this is all her caprice, her fantasy is running hither and thither, but wherever her footsteps pass, their uh, wonders are uh, awoken. They wake up and bloom like flowers. No? And uh, the, her footsteps, the footsteps of her fantasy, are surer than reason. We think things out so carefully. and. Uh, Still, we make mistakes. No? But that fantasy of hers, it's surer, much more reliable than reason, defter than device, much more careful than any of the tricks that we can uh, think up, and swifter than imagination's wings. The wings of imagination are very swift, they can carry us to the edge of the universe. But her powers act more swiftly than that. She makes everything anew. All she new fashions, she shapes it anew by the thought, by the power of thought and word. And she compels all substance, all, not only matter, but the subtle substances too, by her wand, her magic stick of mind. So she also works through mind. Yes, yes. That's her, her power of mind and we'll read about that next time, how that works. So we'll stop there. <coughs> for today. All was uncovered to his sealless eye. A secret nature stripped of her defence once in a dreaded half-light formidable Overtaken in her mighty privacy, lay bare to the burning splendor of his will. In shadowy chambers, lit by a strange sun, and opening hardly to hid mystic keys, her perilous arcanes and hooded powers confessed the advent of a mastering mind and bore the compulsion of a time-born gaze. Incalculable in their wizard modes, immediate and invincible in the act, her secret strengths 
native to greater worlds, lifted above our needy, limited scope, the occult privilege of demigods, and the sure power pattern of her cryptic signs, her diagrams of geometric force, her potencies of marvel fraught design, courted employment by an earth nursed might. A conscious nature's quick machinery, armed with a latent splendor of miracle, the prophet passion of a seeing mind and the lightning bareness of a free soul force. All once impossible deemed could now become a natural limb of possibility, a new domain of normalcy supreme. An almighty occultist erects in space this seeming outward world which tricks the sense. He weaves his hidden threads of consciousness. He builds bodies for his shapeless energy. Out of the unformed and vacant vast, he has made his sorcery of solid images, his magic of formative number and design, the fixed irrational links none can annul. This crisscrossed tangle of invisible laws. His infallible rules, his covered processes, achieve unerringly an inexplicable creation where our error carves dead frames of knowledge for a living ignorance. In her mysteries moods, divorced from the Maker's laws, she too as sovereignly creates her field, her will shaping the undetermined vasts, making a finite of infinity. She too can make an order of her caprice. As if her rash superb wagered to outvie the veiled creator's cosmic secrecies. The rapid footsteps of her fantasy amid whose falls wonders like flowers rise are surer than reason, defter than device, and swifter than imagination's wings. All she knew fashions by the thought and word compels all substance by her wand of mind.